All right, welcome to week two, also known as lecture two. Um, this is the continuance of the information dump that is this course at the start. Uh, as I stated previously, at least I've said it to some students, there's two ways of teaching this course. is either teach all the terminology and all the theory at the beginning, get it out of the way, or split and stretch it out through the speaking of. Split it up and over the rest of the term and stretch it all out. I prefer to do all the terminology stuff right at the beginning and get it over with. It makes the first couple of weeks really te tedious, but over all said and done, it's better because then you have all the terminology and all the concepts in your head as you're working with the rest of it. Okay, so we're actually going to be talking about the, this. When we talk about entities, attributes, and that kind of stuff, we're talking about data modeling. Data modeling is the process of exploring data structures. You look at the data, you look at how it's structured, and then you make a model out of it. And in the end, you make a, usually you'll make a pretty picture, or sort of a picture. Those of you that have started on lab two have already started making their pictures for the first time. And uh, the, the rest of you will discover it as you go. Um, when you're talking about modeling, it uses three terms, actually there's more than three terms, but these are the three that you have to worry about. There's entities, instances, and attributes. And I'll go through those in excruciating detail in a few minutes. But first, I gotta talk about the different kinds of models. There are three kinds of models. Well, there's more than three, but there's, when you talk about data modeling, there's three common types. And essentially, they're subsets of each other. There's the conceptual, which is the very most basic type of diagram. It has very little information in it. There's a logical, which is shows what the different attributes are, what the entities are, what the relationships are between them. Then there's the physical, as in when you take the logical diagram and you actually map it to a specific database server. So that is the conceptual, you can think of it as the guy who says, I want to build a new house. It's going to have three rooms, a kitchen, two bathrooms, and a basement, an attached garage. That's the concept. The logical is he sat down with, um, say, a designer, and they designed a house. So now they've got a house. They know roughly what the layout's going to be. Then they take the design. They give it to the architect, which then actually makes the blueprints for the construction. And the, the architect will make the blueprints based on the different rules and regulations in each area. So each database server has its own rules. It has its own basics of how things are done. Oh no. Oh, I'm back. Watch the wires. Okay. Yeah, it's still in the recording. It won't be gone from there, so it's good. Um, and then the physical is because that's specific to the database server you're working with. Each database server has does its own little things. So it's like a blueprint where it's been designed to a specific standard in certain areas. Like the way a house is built in North America is not how a house is built, say, in Sweden. And it's definitely not how it's built in, say, Japan. The construction rules are completely different in each place. Therefore, as you go, the fifth, what we're going to worry about in this course is mostly the logical and the physical, because you can usually skip the conceptual for the most part, unless you have to deal with managers that don't understand anything. They just like simple little diagrams that show little bubbles and say, oh, we've got these three things. Uh, but conceptuals are a good thing to start with. Now, a conceptual diagram includes only the important entities and relationships. In other words, all the major pieces are there. It may or may not list the attributes. The attributes are, as I talked about last week, are the things that describe some, an object or an event or a thing or a concept. If it's a regular conceptual diagram, then there's no attributes. If it's an extended conceptual diagram, then there's attributes. And there's usually no primary keys. What does it look like? I'll actually draw one quickly on the board. That's a conceptual diagram. Let me move to the other side now, for the other people. That's a conceptual diagram. There's two entities, there's a relationship. It doesn't even describe what the connections are, what any of it is. If we're talking about the extended one,
there. That's an extended diagram where we show the attributes. Not what the data types are. That doesn't follow any naming rules. There's no primary keys. There's no major structural things. It's just to explain the concepts of what things are. They are used in the industry. They're just not used very much anymore. They used to be really, really popular back in the 70s and the 80s when people were just starting to grasp the concept of how data was handled inside a computer. And they had to convince their bosses who have never actually touched a computer in their life what this stuff meant. So they liked these kinds of diagrams to make things simple. The logical diagram. The logical diagrams is, if you've seen, those of you that have started Lab 2 have seen something between a logical and a physical. A logical diagram contains all the entities, the relationships amongst them. It, all the attributes are defined. All the primary keys are defined. Foreign keys are all defined also. And you know, do normalization. This is all concepts you're going to learn about later. But the logical diagram is the bread and butter of the database design industry. It's the diagram that almost everybody uses to start with. And many design packages, not the one we're using, because the one we're using is actually really basic, but many of the more expensive design packages out there, such as uh, um, Data Architect or uh, Toad Data Modeler, which some of you may have seen the word Toad in some of the labs by accident, um, ERWIN, some of these more expensive packages that cost thousands of dollars, We'll start with a logical diagram, and then you hit a button, and it converts it automatically to a physical diagram for you. You just go click, click, and magically it happens, and usually it works. But the logical diagram is where, for the most part, we're going to worry about in this course. The physical diagram is the next level out. It specifies all tables and columns, or fields, depending which terminology you want to use. And it's by it should say specifies. I don't know. I got a typo there, but it specifies all tables and columns. In other words, everything that will be physically put into the database is now defined. It's complete. It's like the difference between the designer's sketch of your house and the architect's blueprints that has you know all the lines that shows where each stud gets put in and where the, all the wiring is supposed to run and where every window is within you know millimeters. The physical diagram is precise. Foreign keys are completely defined. Sometimes you'll do be doing something called denormalization. Normalization is a topic I covered in week three or four. Um, physical considerations are taking here. So once you start taking the physical aspects of what the database server can do, it may change what it looks like. So it doesn't look like the logical diagram anymore. Because just because the, the designer says you're going to put this big giant window here, the architect will go, ha, 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 no, you can't do that. That's a load-bearing wall. You can't put a window there. So sometimes, based on the rules, you can't always bring the logical concept across in high fidelity. You end, you end up losing something, or you gain something in the process. And the physical data model will be different for every database server. So that means if you're doing a, da a design, and you're creating it for Postgres, you can't just take that design and carry it over and try to use it on Oracle, because the data types are different. You can't take it and move it to Microsoft SQL Server because the data types are different. As the data types change, as the database servers evolve away from the basic con standards, um, each diagram will be different for every server. So the diagrams you guys are going to generate this term are all physical diagrams for Postgres, because that's what you guys all have installed on your machines. OK, now some more terminology. Da database design terminology can is really complex. Uh, but there's some basics. Basically, the lecture today is going to cover the basics. I'll cover you for 90% of your needs. And that, believe me, that 90% will cover you for a lot more than just 90%. It's the, the odd little words that will crop up elsewhere. You can probably derive the meaning based on the context. The first one, and this is the big one, and this one you have to know because this shows up on tests and exams. So it's an important concept to know. There's something called an entity type, or it's usually just abbreviated to entity. So it's two names that mean the exact same thing. Um, the database industry is one of those weird ones where they like giving the same name to more, multiple names to the same thing. It's just how they are. They can't agree on what things should be called. So we end up with two names that mean the exact same thing. An entity type and an entity is the exact same thing for all intents and purposes. It represents a collection of data. 
So it basically represents a thing. What's this thing? It could be people, places, an event, other things. Um, such as, I forget, I can't think after you've covered places, people, and events, there's not a whole lot left after that. Uh, processes would be another one, like an order process. Somebody calls, picks up the phone, places an order. There's a process there. You have to model the process of how that data is going to get stored. And that ends up being an order, which is now a thing, which then gets shipped, which is now a shipment, which is also a thing. So they become things. As things get created, they get defined. And the more defined they are, the better. But at its basic point, it's an entity type. In other words, if I use the term student, that's an entity type. As I discussed last week, students all have similar attributes. They all have the same basic set of attributes. You have names, you have dates of birth, you have genders, you have addresses, you have phone numbers, email addresses. Those are all attributes that make up a type of entity. You have an entity instance. So as I was just talking about a students as an entity type, each every one of you is an instance of a student. So an instance is a snapshot of one example of the data that goes into the entity type. So you're an instance, you're an instance, someone over there is an instance. Whoever it is that didn't make eye contact, you're an instance. But those are an instance. So an entity is a student, and ins an instance is a specific student. Now, when we talk about entities, which we just finished discussing roughly what they are, there's two kinds of entities. There is a strong entity, a strong entity that is not dependent on another entity. In other words, it is able to stand upon itself. For example, a student is a strong entity. You have a primary key, a student number. It identifies you uniquely. It, your existence doesn't depend on the existence of someone else. This is not a toxic relationship where your value is determined by somebody else's existence. That's a weak entity. It always has a primary key. That means that each instance, also known as a row, can be uniquely identified. You can pick out one subset of data out of the group by their primary key value. In other words, if I call out somebody's student number, and assuming you all knew your student number, by the student number, you should be able, I should be able to pick somebody out of this group. Yes. 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 Once we get to the physical side of it. At the concept side, yes, the entity would be a table later. The instance becomes a row later. But the instance is an example of the data that would go into a type. So a strong entity is able to exist onto its own, by itself, all on its own. A, for example, teachers are strong entities because we have an employee number. We exist on our own. We may derive some of our values elsewhere in the school, like what department I teach in, but we are still identifiable onto ourselves. Weak entities. Weak entities depend on the existence of a tr strong entity. In other words, and I made the joke, and some class, some groups don't like it when I make that joke, I say, a weak entity is like a guy who's got a dominating girlfriend whose existence cannot, he cannot exist unless he's got a girlfriend. He has no girlfriend, he does not exist. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, I, I'm keeping it that way, at least I can pick on the guys, they're not going to complain. Right, but the basically they are weak entities because he can't exist without their girlfriend. Where's the guy? Oh, there's his girlfriend. He can't be far. Right, it's, it's essentially that's a weak entity. In other words, as far as the data is concerned, it's unable to exist unless it's owned by a strong entity. Often an example of this would be an order. How many of you have ordered stuff on Amazon recently? How many of you order stuff on Amazon all the time? <laughs> How many of you get stuff delivered automatically every month from Amazon? Okay, I might be the only one in here. Subscribe and save, it's great. But when you order from Amazon, often you order more than one thing so you can get the free shipping, right? Yeah. So when you think about this, this order has two items added to the order. Those items 
that, that particular item in the order, not the item itself elsewhere, but the item within the order is a weak entity. Because you've ordered this item, it cannot exist inside that order unless you've created an order. So when you look, you place an order, when you look at a receipt from the grocery store, let's go with that one. Everybody's, how many people here have actually bought groceries? Actually, I'd, you'd be surprised. I usually get about half a dozen hands that don't go up because, you know, mommy and daddy buy their groceries for them. But, you know, if you've never bought groceries, it's an enlightening experience. You should go do it. But when you look at your receipt from the grocery store, you go to Loblaws and you buy stuff, you'll see that your receipt has a bunch of things that you bought. Those entries cannot exist unless your receipt's been processed. Right? Therefore, those are weak entities. They cannot exist without a parent, which in this case is your, your purchase, your receipt for your purchase. That's a weak entity. It usually has a partial key, what they call a partial key. It has no primary key of its own. For example, back to the receipt. When you think about it, and I'll even put a little picture on the board. I'll do it over here so my camera catches it. Okay, you'll have like this. And the way this would work is these guys, this cannot exist unless this, these guys exist also. And in here you'd have the receipt number and the item number. Those two combined, you can find a single line. But they cannot exist without both. That's what's called, part. these are partial keys. In other words, it, only, it needs parts of a, another object's keys to, su to survive. And it uses identifying relationships, as in these cannot exist without these. Both being included, that makes it identifying, as in it's identified by its relationship to another object, as is unlike a strong entity where you're identified uniquely by a single thing. Yes? Normally, on a weak entity, there is no primary key. It has no primary keys. It's just a bunch of foreign keys. A properly designed table, yes, it would have to have a primary key. F uh, weak entities are becoming less and less used. Uh, why? Um, <coughs> modern programming techniques frown upon it. Um, it's entirely possible to have a moment where something goes horribly wrong and the data gets damaged. And maybe you don't want, especially with the new, for example, the new privacy laws, which is making every business's life a living nightmare, especially the new ones coming out in Europe. For example, let's just say our receipt <laughs> cannot exist without a customer already attached to it. And suddenly the customer says, you must delete all my information. You'd lose the fact that anything was sold if you deleted anything they belonged. <coughs> Therefore, the receipts have to be able to retain as a strong entity on their own. That's why weak entities are becoming less and less accepted because it's harder to detach data if its existence depends on something else. So as I was saying, weak entities are slowly being discontinued. It still exists, especially if you, you end up getting a job where they have really old legacy systems. You may see these. These weird little tables that don't have primary keys that contains tons of data that's referenced all over the place. It's a complete mess. And then the first thing they tell you is don't touch that table. Whatever you do, don't touch that table until they actually know what it's doing. All right. Attributes. Page one. Excuse me. I discussed attributes already last week a bit. They describe an entity, and I put the word type in brackets because you can use the word entity or entity type interchangeably. It should be cohesive to your data needs. Now, there's a weird phrase. It means that the, the attributes should have all the different attributes attached to an entity type 
should make sense for that entity type. If I go back to students, right? We have certain attributes we all know about. Name, email, address, engine size. It makes absolutely no sense applied to a student. Therefore, it's not co cohesive to the concept of a student. That is what I mean by cohesive. In other words, all the different attributes should make sense. So when you describe a person, you would describe all the things that describe a person. Their name, their height, their weight, if you want to be insensitive. Their hair color, like that's a believable thing. Or lack of, depending on how you want to look at it. You know, date of birth, that kind of stuff. Those are all attributes that are cohesive to a, to a person. Now you could go outside of that and go start adding other attributes to them that really don't describe the person, but you go s amount of RAM, CPU, and hard drive size. You're not describing a person, you're describing their computer. It doesn't make sense to make that part of that entity unless you have a really good reason. Maybe the data model must have it based on whatever you're working on. But normally you tend to stick to stuff that makes sense. Then there's required versus optional. Now those of you that have started working on lab two and those who are reaching ahead to lab three have been asking me questions about null and not null. <laughs> null and not null is the same thing as required versus optional. Now, I hate explaining nulls to level ones. How many of you have been taught the concept of a null? Okay, how many of you actually understand what a null is? Okay, a null is a is a space that's been defined with an absence of value. Picture a box. Inside this box is a vacuum. Vacuum, not like a vacuum cleaner. Like empty ed, like space out there. There is nothing in this box at all. A space has been defined. But there's absolutely nothing in there until, well, you put something in it. Then it's lo no longer null. It's not the same thing as being empty. Null is absence of value. You have a space, but it has an absence of value. Empty is like some people's heads. There's, there's a space, there's air in there, but there's nothing happening. <laughs> right? On the same, <laughs> I like using that as an example. People laugh, but after a while they go, shit, that makes complete sense. Basically put, an empty value is like an empty string. You have a string, which is a piece of text, just because it exists, it's, n it's empty, as in it's a zero-length string. A zero-length string is not the same thing as a null string. A null string means there's a space defined for it, but there's, there's not even the definition of it being empty. It's what happens before it even is empty. You know, if I want to take the scientific look on it, you got the Big Bang and after the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there's nothing. After the Big Bang, there's stuff. Lots of empty space, but stuff. So that's the null versus not null. Not null means the value is required. So when you go to put a value into the database, and if this attribute says it is required, it means it's not null. In other words, it cannot be null. You must give it a value. You're not allowed to have an empty head. So that's the difference between required and optional. And when you're talking about at the design level, they'll use the phrase required versus optional. When you get down to the physical design, it means it's null or not null. Null means it can be empty and never supplied. The space is there, but there's nothing that's ever been put into it. Versus not null, which means you must give it a value. That's the difference. Attributes part two. Simple versus composite. Simple is a regular atomic piece of data. I like throwing out the, the big definitions first. It cannot be broken down. What does that mean? An atomic piece of data for you might be, oh, your student number. It is a single piece of information. It cannot be broken down into smaller pieces. It is complete unto itself. So I, was gonna, I usually use names. But then somebody who's Portuguese would go, ha, 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 you're wrong. <laughs> right, or if you're Spanish, you'd say you're wrong. 
because depending on where you come from, names can have multiple pieces. Therefore, a name can be broken down more than one way. I just finished having a really good conversation about that <laughs> during the lab. Um, but basically put, an atomic value is a single piece of data that cannot be broken down any further. A composite attribute is one that's made up of multiple pieces, such as an address. At the logical stage, I'll run it across. At the logical stage, such as this, we would put down just address. We all know what an address is. The computer doesn't. But we all know what an address is. What is an address? What's it made out of? Street address, postal code, city, state or province, or territorial division, depending where you come from, country, possibly. Um, depending on what country you're in, like the US, your postal code is actually two can be two different numbers now because they screwed up. You think I'm joking. Who thinks five digits would ever be enough? Ever. So that's a composite. So when you're at the design stage, as in you're sitting there with your house designer and he says, yeah, I said, I want a master bedroom with an attached bathroom. And they'll go, big box, attached bathroom. The architect will worry about where all the bits and pieces go in the attached bathroom. So a composite is made up of multiple pieces, such as an address. It can be broken down. Now, the composite attribute can only ever exist at the conceptual level and at the logical level. And really, a composite type of attribute should not even exist at the logical. It's actually kind of frowned upon nowadays. Uh, there once was a time where that was allowed. But realistically, the logical should be just one step away from the physical, which means the address should be broken down to its component pieces. Therefore, when it's time to make the physical design, they must be broken down to each piece. So when you store a person's address, you have to break it down to, to a sane number of pieces, mind you. Unless you work, you're writing a database for the postal service, an address is made out of address one, address two, which would be 123 Sum Street, box 52, or apartment three, suite 100. Then you'll usually have the city, the, the territorial division, such as a state or a province, a postal code, also known as a zip code if you're an American, and usually a country, because if you mail internationally. Some people will do the same thing with phone numbers. People don't realize how complicated phone numbers can be. People look at a phone number. They go, oh, it's only a set of numbers. Ah. No, not really. There's four pieces to every phone number, at least in North America. There's the country code, also known as one. So you know you do your long distance call, you go one. You're actually calling country code one, just so you know. Zero four four is the UK. The next three digits is your area code. In other words, it's, it's uh, the first routing prefix that tells it it's in this general area. Um, the next three digits, at least in North America, is known as the, um, holy crap, I used to know this, the exchange, which is a smaller subdivision. So 613 would be this whole area. The next, the next one would be the exchange, which is the closest office to your house, which there once was a time where there literally was somebody sitting there with the cables going clunk, clunk, connecting them manually. And then the last four digits is your phone number. When I grew up in my hometown, I could actually only die. I only needed to do was dial the four last four digits. It was great. I wanted to call my friend. Because we had the rotary dials, right? God, I'm old. Right? Do this, and you'd call four digits at work, and then eventually we started having to dial all the numbers. But a phone number can be broken down to those pieces. Now, depending on what kind of work you're trying to do, do you need to break it down to all those pieces or not? It's a bit of a decision you have to make at the design stage, as in, do I really need to break it down that far? No, not really. You can just store it in just the digits. And you can worry about the formatting at display time. Unless you really need to break it down to that much detail. Now, there's another, for, yeah. Just speak up just a little. Yeah. 
if we explain that, for example, I was talking about an address being a composite data type, where an address is made up of multiple pieces. When it's time to actually do the physical design, right at the end, when you're about to push it into the database server, it has to be broken down to its component pieces. So you'd have an address one, an address two field. So instead of just a single attribute called address, you'd have address one, address two, city, province, postal code, country. So those that one attribute becomes six attributes. That's what I mean by explode it, break it to its component pieces. So now there's this, the next one's actually the hard one. Singled versus multi-valued. Single valued attributes are easy to understand. What is your student number? One value. Single value. What is your date of birth? Most people only have one. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I've seen it where somebody didn't know what their date of birth was. Or even better, February 29th. They actually have two dates of birth because none of the computer system will ever let you put somebody's date of birth as February 29th because it's impossible to manage properly. Therefore, you end up having either March 1st or February 28th as your date of birth. Therefore, you end up with two different dates of birth. It happens. And if they want to be really anal, they actually make you tr keep track of it. Okay? But those are single-valued attributes. Multi-valued is a list of values. Let's, for example, what skills do you have? You start listing off your skills. PHP, database, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. So I'm listing off a set of my basic skill set. Right? It's a list of values. When you are describing something at the beginning, you're going, entity is, you know, employee. An attribute would be skills. What skills do they have? You can't store a list into the database into a single field, and not unless you want to be fired. It's the dumbest thing you can do. It's impossible to work with. So what happens is when you have a list of possible values, when it's time to normalize the database, which is a concept I teach later, the, this skills attribute will become its own table, its own entity. It becomes its own thing. So if you had... Hold on, I'm going to actually draw it so that it might make sense. Oh, look at this brand new eraser. I'm privileged. During the fall term, this wouldn't even be in the room anymore. So if at first I go, employee, and we have an attribute for name, and we have an attribute for skills, And it has, oh, that's the wrong notation. It's this one. Those are supposed to be curly brackets. There's actually a notation for, for multi-valued. So w at the logical stage, it's okay to do this. When it's time to go to the physical stage, what you'd end up with is you'd have It would look something like this. Now I'm going to explain these this notation later in the course. But this is an attribute that became a table because it's a list. The second you have a list of things, it becomes its new table. If it's a list, such as a multi-valued attribute, which could be skills, could be degrees, diplomas, educational background. Or if you look at a course like this, you could say database course, skills taught, design. SQL, advanced topics, it's a list of possible values, but realistically they need to be broken down to its own component pieces. Yes? At this point in time, uh, depending on how you design it, it could become a weak entity. If you are going to do it the proper way, the modern way, it'll be a strong entity onto itself. Uh, you'd actually go way past this. When you're actually, when later on a couple of days and a couple of more lectures, you'll see how far we'd push this. As it stands, it, they're both, uh, this is a weak entity. It cannot exist without that one there. They're the same thing. Essentially, they end up, basically, if you have an 
if you have a if you have a simple attribute will often be also be a single valued a simple attribute only contains a single piece of information which usually means it's a single value that goes into it right a date of birth is a single piece of information will have a, so it's an atomic value that contains a single value that's the goal you want everything to be atomic and have single value that's the, that's the end goal you don't want lists. You don't want composites. You want it broken down to its smallest component pieces. Good? Okay. All right. Now the next one. Stored versus derived. This one's actually easy to understand. Stored is a value you actually put in the database. A derived attribute you can calculate. For example, do you need to store a person's age if you're already storing their date of birth? How do you calculate a person's age? Now minus date of birth will tell you X number of years. Days, months, minutes, seconds, depending on how precise you want to be. That is a derived attribute. You don't need to store a person's age because you can calculate it. If you can do math to get the value, so if you can use math on the other columns of your table or the other attributes of your, your entity, to get a value, that means it's derived. You don't store it unless there's a really good reason. Another example, I'll go back to my receipts. Now, just went to Loblaws. I just bought some bananas. 49 cents a pound. I bought three pounds. How much is it going to cost me for my bananas? 147. Thank you for doing the math. I wasn't going to even bother. 147. Do I need to really store the 147? No, because I can go with 3 times 49. 0.49. That's a derived attribute. You don't need to store it. The only time you store it is for performance reasons. Or if the price can magically change. Anybody here ever buy something and you discover two days later it went on sale? And then you're mad? Because then you call, up, call them up and they won't, they won't roll back the price to what it was, what it is now, even though you bought it two days ago. <coughs> Fido. <laughs> um, using that as an example. Amazon's nice. They'll usually do it. Uh, Costco will. Walmart depends how disgruntled with life their employee is. <laughs> that day. <laughs> he goes, yeah. And Loblaw's never in hell. Never going to happen. So derived attributes are values you don't store because you can calculate them. It's OK to exist at the conceptual and logical stage, as in it's OK to have it up here. So for example, on my employee, I could have date of birth. And I could also put in age, because maybe somebody thinks that's an important piece of information to track. Therefore, it's a derived attribute. As you can see, I put it in with little dots. I'm not even teaching this notation to you guys. I'm just showing it to you as I go, and you're going to absorb some of it. This is something we're going to store. This is something we can calculate. When it's time to go to the, f once we go to the last step, we do the logical and the physical designs, this goes away because we don't need it. It's good at the concept side, but once you realize it can be calculated, don't bother store it. Nowadays, our, the computer systems are fast enough that, and the drives are big enough. You know, some of you are thinking, a oh, terabyte drive, that's no room. Huh. I remember working with, you know, one meg database files. Trust me, you did not store that age, ever. You didn't have room to store that age. And what happens if suddenly you discover that their date of birth was wrong? That means if you're storing the age in the database, you have to update the age. You discover that they were born on December 31st, not January 1st. Suddenly they're a year older. Even though they're only 24 hours older, but they're a year older mathematically. Yes. Well, you, no, you, yeah, you'd have to update every year. So you'd have to batch process every single day, nightly, going through, crawling through, and updating everybody's age. Why on earth would you do that? 
it's something you can calculate at display time. You retrieve the data out of the database. Your code does whatever it needs to do, and it goes now minus dot equals age. The only time that you keep these derived attributes normally is for performance reasons. You would store them for performance reasons so that, for example, Amazon, I can guarantee stores their order, their line totals. Three boxes of Oreos at a buck ninety nine equals whatever the heck that would be. You don't need to calculate it. Whatever that number is, they'll actually store the value so that when you pull it up, they don't need to do the calculation because they have so much traffic that those little calculations actually eat up CPU time. It actually slows down everybody's experience. For reporting purposes, you'll you'll store the derived attributes, but for most part, for small solutions, and I'm talking, you know, solutions with a couple million rows, 10 million rows, you don't store it. It's when you're talking about billions of rows and, you know, tens of millions of people hammering away on it every second. That's when you start storing the derived attributes. It's a matter of scale. Yes? It's so that you don't have to calculate every single time something happens for it. So if you just say, how old are you right now? My, I'll calculate it. But if I had to say, if I had to say every single one of you asked me at the exact same time, how old are you? It'd be faster for me to just have a card with, you know, 40 something on it. I'd just hold it up, you know, because it's already calculated. How old are you? Whereas me going, how old am I? Oh crap, I don't know how old I am. <laughs> you know? Then after a while, if enough people ask me, after a while my brain can't cope anymore. And then it slows down, and each answer gets progressively slower because there's a backlog of me having to answer everybody and having to do the calculation every single time. Therefore, you'd store the value for performance reasons. Does that make sense? Sort of clear? Okay. So, attributes five, keys one. It's not a sports score. It's the end of the attributes and the start of the keys. At, there's one last kind of attribute. It's known as identif an identifier. It's also known as a key. The identifier attribute is also known as a key. What is it for? It lets you identify something uniquely. I've been using a student number because each of you have a unique identifier as far as the school is concerned, and that's your student number. I have a unique identifier as far as the school is concerned. That's my employee number. As far as the federal government of Canada, my SID number is my unique identifier. My driver's license is my unique identifier to the MTO. My health card number is my unique identifier to, to the Ontario Health Service. Those are unique identifiers we have. But they're also keys because it's a way for something to be found uniquely. It's usually made up of one or more attributes. If you're doing it right, one attribute Multiple attribute, ident multi multiple attribute identifiers, oh, that's a mouthful. Multiple attribute identifiers are known as composite identifiers, are also known as a compound key. This is a compound key. It's a pain in the ass. Why? Because, actually, this one's easy because it's only two. If I had a design where one table derives its identification from four or five other tables, you're going to need to search on five different pieces of information to find a unique row. And what happens if you don't have one of those five pieces of information? <laughs> you're done. It's over. You can't find it. As a rule of thumb, at least depending on what database prof you ask, you should only have a single field identifier, which I will actually discuss how to achieve that goal in a few moments. At least I hope I will. Okay, keys part two. Now we're done talking about attributes. I think I've killed and beaten that horse enough. Keys part two, the candidate and the primary. Now, I want, I'm going back to the composite key just for a second. A composite key is a key that contains two or more attributes. I like to have that one on that slide because it's good to remind people of what it is. A candidate key or a candidate keys are keys that Uniquely identify each row in a relation, maybe. They're called candidate keys because at the logical stage and the conceptual stage, 
those thing, those keys will probably work. So we start creating a database to track students. We're always going back to students because you guys know what the heck a student is. At least I hope you do. And at first, when they start doing the design, and I know this for a fact, there once was a time when they did the initial designs, at least not this school, but the college I went to, didn't have student numbers originally. The first couple of years, they didn't have student numbers because they didn't have any foreign exchange students. They're such a hole in the ground school that they didn't even think of that, that somebody from another country would want to go see them. But so they actually used your SIN number, your social insurance number as your unique identifier. So you'd go to the registrar's office and spout out your SIN number out in public. Can I have your, uh, your identifier? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the guy behind you knows who you are. It was a great system. And after a few years, you know, they suddenly discovered that SIN numbers weren't a good key because suddenly they had people that didn't have SIN numbers. So Canada keys are keys that could, that could be used to uniquely identify a, an instance of data, a row of data. The primary key is the Canada key that is chosen at the end of the design process. So while you're designing, you're going, this might be a unique identifier, this could be a unique identifier, this could be a unique identifier. Once you've reached the end stage, you'll go, well, that one's no good, that one's no good, but that one's good, so that becomes the primary key. Or the primary key is this one plus this one, so then you end up with a composite key, composite primary key, which I, is, which I frown upon because it's not a good technique to use. There's a way to not do this. Because you know what, you could after, I can guarantee you could be doing, having the composite key going happily for a month or two and suddenly somebody shows up with a piece of information that doesn't fit in. And that's just how it is. So composite keys are breaky, as in they don't, they're not reliable. They're reliable, yes, but not reliable to the sense where you'd want to bet your house on it. Back to the identifiers. You should try to choose an identifier when you're choosing your identifiers that A, will not change it in value and B, will not be null. So when I use students, not everybody here is a Canadian citizen. Therefore, you don't have a SIN number. Therefore, SIN numbers are no good. For everybody who's a foreign exchange student, odds are the SIN number will be null for you. Therefore, it's not a valid key. I'm not going to ask if anybody in here has ever had their identity stolen, but you know what one of the first steps is after your identity has been stolen is to go get a new SIN number. Why? So they can invalidate your old SIN number so that they can't use it to steal your identity anymore. Therefore, there once was a time where a person's SIN number was invalid. They cannot be changed. It was set in stone. Now it's not. It takes 15 minutes to ask for a new SIN number. You go up to the, to the desk, you say, my SIN number was stolen, I've had my, now my crap's been stolen, and I know I owe $10 million. And they go, ha, 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 okay, give me five minutes. Tick, 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 tick. It'll be in the mail, and here's your new number, your new card will be in the mail. Actually, you don't even get cards anymore. Just a piece of paper with your number on it. Here's your, here's your new SIN number. You go home, you put it away in your safe, and you never tell anyone whatever it is. Then you go to the banks and you change your SIN number, but your SIN number can now change. Same thing with, should you ever use your email address as a unique identifier? <laughs> no. How many people here have had the same email address since day one? Wow. Gmail, right? Hotmail. Oh, God. Dude. That's like the bunny ranch. Bad. So don't think things that change. Don't think things that can be empty. Avoid intelligent identifiers. Don't use locations or where part of it could be um, built off something else. For example,
orders. Orders have an order number, right? Usually. Now imagine if you had the order line was the order number underscore line number. So you'd have five five three underscore two two. That's an intelligent identifier. As in it's not intelligent. It's real dumb. Why? Because A, this assumes its value from something else, and theoretically it's possible the order number may change. That means that all these have to be rebuilt. The other thing you should do is avoid substitute simple keys for composite keys. Remember earlier where, actually I just erased it, where you had um, order number and product number? Instead of doing that, you'd substitute those and you'd create a new key all on its own. And I actually talk about that. I think it might be the next slide. <laughs> it is. Did I jump from three to four? Two to four? Damn. There once was a there was there once a three and I deleted it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what surrogate keys are. That's, that's what I'm about to talk about. Yes. It usually better. Some old school database people will fight you on that one, saying that they like using what they call natural keys, as in keys that derive their value from real things out there. But they're wrong. I'm even going to put this on YouTube and say they're wrong. They're just wrong. Because realistically, Things that exist out there are malleable. Even though they think, malleable means it can change. Such as your identifier can change. Your passport number can change because when they issue you a new passport, you get a new number with it. Even your, your health cards in Ontario. How many people here have got new health cards recently? Or had to renew their health card? You know that last three letter digit changes, right? Or you get a new credit card. You know that code on the back, the CVV code? It changes every time you get a new card. These things are things that are malleable. They change. They're not good identifiers. So somewhere along the way, some very bright person came up with a concept called surrogate keys. Surrogate keys are also known as synthetic keys. They mean the same thing. So if you see the phrase synthetic, it means the same thing as surrogate. A surrogate key is a column inside the database, and also known as an attribute, so a column or an attribute inside the database, that has been added with it has no value out in the real world. It is completely fictitious. As in, it has zero relation to what's happening outside, out there. Your student numbers are surrogate keys. They're numeric. Somebody comes in and they're, you know, zero, four, zero, blah, 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 five. The next person at the desk goes up, they'll be six. The next person will be seven, eight, nine, ten. The number just goes up, 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 and you can't go back. You, can, you, cannot, you cannot give an old number to somebody, to replace, like delete that one and reuse it. If you delete it, that number's gone. Because that person may come back. You never know. The unique values of surrogate key are assigned by the database, not by the programming language, not by the users. The database server assigns it the value automatically. So you know those I did lab two and I had you create tech columns with a type called big serial, or I told you to use the identifier, I don't remember which one it was. I think I said to use big serial. The big serial is a magic data type. It's an integer that gets its value from a serialized queue. One, two, three, four. That is a, a surrogate key. They're usually short and they're normally numeric. And the values do not change. In other words, once you've signed number three to a record, three exists forever. Even if you delete that record, three can never be reused because it's been assigned. Once it's been out the door, it's out the door. Sort of like when you get a movie ticket, right? And there's a magic, a unique number on the movie ticket or the concert ticket. And you know, they scan it, you walk in, the next guy behind you can't use the same number again because it's been used. 
you can, you're welcome to hand the ticket back across the guy and try to get them to come in a second time. It's not going to work because it's been used. Now, why would they normally be numeric? Numbers are a heck of a lot easier for a database to work with than text. Let the letter A, is it uppercase A or lowercase A? Which one comes first? Uppercase A or lowercase A? On the other hand, which one comes before first? Three or 755? Three. You don't need to think about it. The database server knows numbers. It handles numbers really well, which makes them ideal as a primary key. If it's a numeric value that's set by the database server that has nothing to do with the outside world and it's set automatically and the values never change and they can never be reused, that's pretty damn unique. And what do you want for a primary key? Unique. Foreign keys. This is, has to do with relationships. Foreign keys are an attribute who gets its value from another key. In other words, a foreign key's value is derived from the primary key of another table. For example, the employee has a number. It's n his number is a primary key. The skill will have an employee number column which will derive its value from the primary key from here. For example, each and every one of you have a course assigned to you. So the course has a unique identifier inside of it, inside the database system here at the college. Whatever the magic number is, I don't know what it is. For CST 8215-18S, which is right here right now, there's a magic number in the system. You have a student number. It's also a magic number because it's been gen generated. Now, in the grades table, there'll be a combination of course identifier, student identifier, grade. So when you think about access, when you go into access and later on you get to see your grades in access, which would be like third week of August, when you go into access and you look at that, there will be a column in there for your student number, a column for the course code, and your grade. The student number and the course code are foreign keys. That means their values are actually coming from somewhere else. And those values are usually primary keys of another table. That's a foreign key in its simplest form. And now, so they're dependent on the value of something else. It's sort of like if you have how many people in here have kids? Hot damn, I love mature students. I get to make examples. You have kids. The kid cannot exist without your personal donation of DNA. <laughs> right? Both sides, it applies to both girls and boys. Although on one side is known as a donor. But, you know, you have your, you provide a certain amount of stuff. However, Come on, let me go with this. <laughs> but basically put, what's happening is, essentially the child inherits half the DNA from each parent. That means basically half their DNA comes from a foreign key, which is one of the two parents, is the male half and the female half usually. And, you know, those are foreign keys. They, they build, the two keys build up a unique ad attribute of its own that derived on the values of the parent. It's, the simp that's a, it's not a really precise example, but it makes sense. Yes? If it's a weak entity, for example, children are the best example of a weak entity. They cannot exist without two genetic parents. They can exist without the parents, but they can't exist without two gener genetic parents. Right? That makes them a weak entity because they cannot exist unless they've got the donations coming from the parents. Yes, but once they grow up past a certain stage, they end up getting their own primary identifiers, SIN numbers, student numbers, right? They end up with their own unique identifiers. Um, but they're foreign keys. Even though they have a unique identifier such as a SIN number or a health card number, whatever, they're still half yours and half someone else's. That means that they're still foreign keys in here that, that 
using DNA tracing, they can identify that you're the father or the mother or whatever is applicable. And that's, you know, their foreign keys. The DNA is the foreign key. Yeah. The, uh, the, st the strong entities? It can have foreign keys. Yes. Yeah, you can both. Uh, after a while, very few tables have don't have relations going into them of some sort. The ones that do that don't are known as reference tables or lookup tables. So those that are trying to do lab three have seen the phrase reference table. It's basically a strong entity that has no parents. You can have a you can have a strong entity that has parents. Obviously, we all exist. Okay. Now, I, I just finished talking about this. So I'm going to go through this slide fairly quickly. A composite key is a key that's composed of two or more attributes. I keep bringing that one up because it's a concept that people forget. Natural key. It's a key that, that has a value based on something in the real world. A synthetic key, also known as a surrogate key, which I was just finished discussing. It's a key that has no business meaning. So if you talk about business systems, the number five has no business meaning in the business. It's just a number. It uniquely identifies a row in the database. Accounting number might have meaning. A primary key is the preferred key for an entity type, and the foreign key gets one or more attributes. Okay, now, this is where I trash talk natural keys. I list the problems with natural keys, not the benefits. Because the only benefit is, is it, it visually makes sense. That's the only benefit to a natural key. The value makes sense as in you know this is a sin number. You know what this, this value has meaning. That's the only benefit it has. On the other hand, size, the size of the primary key. Surrogate keys don't have a problem with sizes because they're usually a single integer. That's about as small as a piece of data can get, right? The number one can be identified with, you know, one bit. You know, you can go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? I only use three fingers and I count it to seven. It's magic. Integers are the smallest piece you can store inside a computer. It takes no room. On the other hand, let's just say you're using somebody's name as your primary key. Where's my favorite Portuguese guy? Your name would be sucked index. Yeah, your name would suck to index. My name sucks to index. Why? Because it's got index every letter. And that means that instead of looking up for number 56, it's got to look up for G-A-U-D-R-E-A-U-L-T. That's just my last name. Imagine if I had a Quebec name that was hyphenated. And what's worse is it's got to start from the G, G-A-U, and it goes, ah, oh, there's still 75 of these. D, oh, now we're down to 25. R, now we're down to 16. E, A, U, oh crap, now we got the ones that were baptized and not baptized. That's the LT at the end. The names, right? Those are a pain in the ass to index. They take up lots of room. To store a person's name is eight, basically eight bits per letter, unless you're talking about moon runes. Then it's 16, it's 32 bits per letter. By that I mean, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, all the, all the languages that use symbolic notations for words instead of actual letters to break it down. Those characters take up a lot of room because you can't store just parts of the word. If you got the character for the, for the dog and then you got another character that just so happens to include the word dog, you got to store both those characters. You can't store dog plus this. It's just how the languages work. They're a nightmare to index. On the other hand, seven. Seven's not hard to index. It's not, it doesn't take up a lot of room. Foreign key size. If the primary key takes lots of room, what do you think happens to the foreign key? It takes up just as much room. We have big hard drives nowadays. People say, well, who cares about space? Eventually, if you've got a really big database, it, you're going to care. Aesthetics. Now, that's the eye of the beholder moment. 
Some people say it's great. I can look at the sin number. It's pretty. 55. That's not pretty. I, have, I don't understand what 55 means. Who cares? The end user shouldn't see the 55 anyways. They should never see their primary key. They should just see a record that comes up. Oh, there's my SIM number. Hot damn. They don't need to know that they're number 55 in the database. Cons number four and five. I combine these ones. It used to be two separate ones. Optionality and applicability. Surrogate keys have no problems with people or things not wanting to or being able to provide the data. Back to the students when all we had was SIN numbers. And then the day the first foreign exchange student walked in the door and they go, I don't have a SIN number. Well then, things aren't working anymore because you can't give it to me. All you can give me is a passport number. And look at this, the database can't take that big long number because we didn't plan for it. Or there's the crazy people that, you know, the sovereign domain people who refuse to pretend, the refuse technology to belong to a country. You'll say, what's your SIN number? I don't have one. What's your, what's your driver's, driver's license number? I don't have one. Well, off the jail you go, you're driving without a license. But there's, there's always someone who won't give you a piece of information. It's what it is. Just like you never give someone your SIN number over the phone, ever. That's just dumb. But you don't do that. Because at, at that point, it's an optional piece of information they're providing you. I got two whole screens of things against natural keys. Uniqueness. Primary keys are supposed to be guaranteed to be 100% unique. Surrogate keys are always 100% unique. SIN number, actually no. Let's go with SSN numbers, American SSN numbers. Did you know they've started reusing them? They ran out. And their systems can't be updated to take new num bigger numbers. They've actually started reissuing old SSN numbers. This person's dead. Huh. Little Johnny, here's your new number. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. It's literally how it's going. It goes into the system. The person's now been marked as dead. Their SIN number is marked available, and it gets given to someone else. So little Johnny, his identity has already been stolen. <coughs> or, hey, the person was reported dead, and they just found him living in a shack in the woods. Suddenly, that suddenly two people have the same number. Bad things happen. Little Johnny gets, has to get a new number. Or the other guy just disappears. Take your pick. But there's problems. They're not unique. Privacy. There's no privacy concerns with surrogate keys. Natural keys. Once again, let's go back to our SIN numbers. Imagine if you had to give your SIN number at the grocery store to buy your groceries. Or at giving it to a disgruntled Walmart employee. Can I have your SIN number? <laughs> no. Not happening. Equifax. That big mess in the States. Good times. Everybody, but everybody wishes they didn't go through that. Accidental denormalization. So sometimes when you're redesigning the database, you get rid of fields that you don't need anymore. If you're using a surrogate key, it's not going to go anywhere because it's not real information. Sometimes you delete data when you're denormalizing because you don't need to keep it. Suddenly you nuke part of your primary key. Oops. Cascading updates. Surrogate keys don't change, so you don't have to worry about cascading. For that, I mean, let's go back to our SIN numbers. I am at the bank. I've got a ton of transactions with my SIN number on it. My identity gets stolen. I get a new SIN number. The bank now has to update my SIN number, and it's got to cascade and update every record that I ever had to do with that SIN number. It's cascading updates. CIBC, I'm looking at you. That's how their system used to work. And it was bad. So, you know, nowadays they don't do that, but there once was a time where they did that. So every time you change something, it would cascade and have to update all the child records. The problem is the child record cannot have its value updated unless the parent record already exists 
But when you change the parent record, the child no longer exists val properly. So now you're stuck in this magic loop where neither of them can exist at the same time. How do you handle this? You actually create all new records and delete all the old ones. It's terrible. And the last one is variable character fields, which I discussed next week what those are. But they're long strings. And when you have to do joins on strings, let's say I say your number is 55, and I suddenly go, I need 55. Or I say, I need somebody, and the, their name takes me 20 seconds to say. Then it's 20 seconds of thinking, is that me? Because you're going five seconds, okay, that's not me. It's 10 seconds, that's not me. Shit, he's heading on 20, that must be me. But it takes 20 seconds to even make the initial connection because it takes that long to say the person's name. As opposed to five. Speed. I'm really super simplifying just for the concept, but that's essentially what it is. When you're connecting text, it takes forever because it's got to compare every single character. It's got to check whether it's uppercase, lowercase, whether or not there's an accent on it. It's got to make sure that everything is the same. And if you're going with names, and uh, for example, 11 letters in my last name, 10 or 11, it's going to compare all 11 as opposed to 6. Numbers are better. Okay, surrogate keys theoretically have issues also. Getting the next value. By the way, it's censored on the slide, but I'll say it's bullshit. The database does it for you. It's automagical. I've heard database guys complain, well, our system doesn't let us do the magic number thing. Well, that's because your computer was built in the 70s and you haven't updated your code. It's not, that sounds like a you problem, not a me problem. 99% of database servers out there support auto-incrementing auto keys. And if they don't support it, you can write a function that does it anyways. There's ways around it. Users don't understand surrogate keys. You're number six. If you don't understand what the hell number six is, do you care? You shouldn't even know your number is six. It's just a weird thing about being a student where you actually have to know what your student number is. It's just one of those weird quirks. I bet just because to make life easier for the administrative staff. It's easier to look somebody up other than if I try to find all the Zhangs in the system. Good luck. I think I've got, what, eight in this class alone? Six Zhangs in this class alone? You know, so if I use that as an example, or all the wings, the new, the wings, there's lots of wings in the school. You know, if I use them as an example, you know, there's lots of them. Those are hard to work with. The only time, that's why student numbers are used. But most of the time, users don't care. You shouldn't even show it to them unless you have to. Extra joins. Okay, that one's true. If you know somebody's SID number, you can skip joining the customer to their financial records because you can just go right after the financial record with their SID number. But, who cares? The database servers are so fast that it's just an excuse. It made a difference in the old days. You know, when you ever watch the movies when the tapes are go and then they stop and they go the other way and they go back this way? Well, those were really, really slow. Or the old System 36s where the hard drives would actually stop spinning. And then you'd walk in and actually kick it. That was actually part of my, my job, my co-op. When I was in my co-op, my space was just outside the server room. If I heard the server room go quiet, I had to go in there and kick it. They were replacing the system. The, the server was so old that the drives would turn off at random. And I'd have to go and kick it. And you'd kick it in the vibe. They called it um, percussive maintenance. So you kick it, it caused a little bit of vibration. It unstuck the bearings long enough for it to spin back up. It was hilarious. I, we were all taking bets on the death day. And it was still working when I left. So, you know, it's not an issue anymore. Computers are fast enough that this means nothing. Extra indexes. That's the only valid complaint about surrogate keys. It's the only time you have a valid complaint. Now, I haven't even talked about what indexes are, but I'll give you the two-second bullet so you have a rough idea. An index is a method for the database server to find stuff fast. Right, so it's like a quick lookup, like a cheat sheet of where things are in the database. 
Now, if, and primary keys are always indexed because you have to look them up quickly. So if you're indexing a person's SIN number and you're indexing the primary key, that means you have two indexes, whereas if you're using just the SIN number, you'd have one index. Woo. Back in the tape-to-tape -tape days, it made a difference. Today on our, you know, hard drives that are measured in gigabytes and terabytes, who cares? Honestly, the space usage is not there. It's the only valid argument against the surrogate keys, and it's such a sad argument. It's like the people that argue that the Earth is flat. All right, we're almost done, I think, I hope. The, the relationships won. So I could actually take a break now, but instead I'll, I'd rather let you guys go 10 minutes early. So relationships won. It's a connection between entities. It allows for an organized data structure. I already talked about a little bit where an employee has skills. That's a relationship. As a teacher, I have students. That's a relationship. As students, you guys have courses. That's a relationship. As a school, we have students and teachers and rooms. Those are relationships. There are connections between entities and entity types. In other words, anything that can be derived as a connection is a relationship. Whether it's a valid relationship or not, who knows? But for as far as data modeling concerns are, you model them all and you get rid of the ones you don't need. You thin out the herd to, to a bare minimum number of relationships. Relationships part two. One to many. This is the most common relationship type you'll get out there. 99% of the relationships you'll create is this type. A parent entity instance, in other words, a single snapshot of data can have many child entities. Once again, a teacher can have many students. If you guys have one database teacher, I have many database students, one to many. Parent-child relationship, right? A person can have many kids, but each kid, for example, any man can have many kids. We'll go that way. But every child must have at least one male progenitor somewhere in the system, right? Parent-child. There's always, you know, every woman can have a, a child, but that child can only ever have one biological mother. So the mother can have many kids usually, but the kid can only ever have one parent. One to many. That's the easiest concept, the easiest one to understand. You go to Loblaws and you buy five things. You have one receipt. That receipt has five things, but each of those things exist on one receipt. Once you've paid for it, it's yours. Therefore, it belongs to that receipt. Many to many. Multiple relationships between ta tables. Also known as the Kentucky of relationships. Those that don't get the joke, is, it's hillbillies. Rednecks, you know, cousin, uncle, dad. Essentially, you end up with this, this spider web of relationships between two tables. And they're a nightmare. I once, in, when, I, when I started working for digital equipment, which doesn't exist anymore, but was bought by Compaq, which is a name some of you may recognize, which was then merged with HP. I worked for all three of those companies at the same time because that happened inside eight months. But I once inherited a database that was doing many-to-many -many relationships. Two tables were like this, and I was asked to clean it up, so I went and deleted one row. And after the database server ground was grinding for 20 minutes, I was wondering what the heck the problem was. So I stopped it, and then I restored from a backup. Why? Because this row deleted that row, which deleted this row, which deleted that row, which then deleted this row, which deleted this row, that one, basically deleted the entire table. Because every single row was related to everything else, just like people in Kentucky. They're all interrelated to each other. It's a nightmare to deal with. You don't know what's connected to what. Somewhere along the way, and I actually discussed this later, there is a way of fixing this. It's known as an associative entity. You create a new entity. So just to, as, a, as a basic concept, so you have a, roughly an idea of what I'm talking about visually. Originally, you could have... 
item A, item B. And originally, you'd have this kind of relationship, many to many. So B can have many A's and A can have many B's, and they could actually have the same connections multiple times. Someone came along and said, that's such a stupid idea. They came up with an associative entity. A can have many ABs. B can have many ABs. The combination of one A and one B makes a single relation. It makes the association between the two. So you can have many entries here from here, many entries from here and here. But the good news is if ever we nuke, say, entry number five from here, we can nuke all the number fives from here without losing the fact that maybe there's other connections elsewhere. It's an, known as an associative entity. It bridges two or more table types. That's its purpose in life. It's a bridge. It's a bridge table. We used to call it bridge tables. They're also known as associative entities. Or there's a new phrase a few years that magically cropped up because you know people in database land can never make up their minds what they want to call stuff. They created this table called has and belongs to many. Ha habitums. So this is also known as a has and belongs to many. Because this has values, and it could belong to many of each set. Pardon me? Well, that's that's a foreign kiss. I'm just illustrating it with, with notations. I'm covering the notation next week. But basically put, this is an associative, t this was a, a many-to-many -many that was broken down into an associative entity. So if you have many-to-many, -many, really you need a third table. To bridge them. You make a third table and you connect it using a third table. Pardon? It's a bridge table. Okay, I got two hands and I don't know who was first. Fight. Okay, he wins. His hand was higher. Well, no, it's a one to many, but it has two parents. Mother, father, child. But before you had you had the um, the Kentucky version. I was going to say the Mormon edition, but you know, many to many, right? Where it's all interconnected. This keeps it nice and clean and simple to understand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See, I always feel uncomfortable when I do this because I know I upset at least three people in the room every time. We do not, there is no real reason to ever do many-to-many, -many, ever. <laughs> Never, ever do many-to-many. -many. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the associative takes care of keeping it clean and tidy. Well, okay, this as a whole, you could consider that as a many-to-many. Before, the many many was, was just this piece here. But if you're going to do this, if you really want to call it many to many, it's this. But the word many to many no longer applies because it's an associative entity instead. You'd, if you're going to have a many to many relationship, you create an associative entity instead. If you ever have a case where, many, for example, employees and skills. An employee can have many skills. Each skill could belong to more than one employee. Where I work, for example, you could have five guys that know there's, say there's 10 guys that know C++, three guys that know PHP. P therefore, PHP is known by three people. Three people know PHP. It's many to many. Instead, you create a, a, a table in the bottom that connects the two so that, you know, we fire Chad. We just get rid of those associations that Chad has these skills because he no longer has these skills at this company. But we don't lose the fact that we have Chad's skills, and we don't necessarily lose the fact that we have Chad. Yes? No, this would be the employee, this would be the skills, that would be the... Like that. Okay, the last relationship type is one-to-one. -one. 
also almost never used. Almost. Well, the modern database systems can handle it. There once was a time where you'd use it to divide large tables. Because they're, they're, anybody here remember something called dbase? Okay, good, dbase. Okay, a couple of us remember dbase. dbase had a limit of 64 columns. So let's say if you needed 65, you'd have to create another table and have a one-to-one -one relationship to continue the table on. That was a limitation of the database server. One-to-one -one relationships were created to handle that situation. Or you'd want to use it to isolate um, parts of the table. Before we had what they called column level security where you could say, you can see columns A, B, and C, but you only get C, A. You, you, there once was a time where you couldn't do that, so what you had to do is you created a table that had column A in it, and then you had B and C in another one, and you'd give permissions for both of you to see A and him to see just B and C. So you'd separate it out. Um, but it's actually still done now, so you could actually encrypt the contents of that one table so that it's safe, such as credit card information, SIN numbers. It's encrypted with a hash key so that nobody can actually see the contents. Or you could use it to store short-term data, session information. You log into a website. It stores your current, say, your shopping cart. And it's a one-to-one -one relationship to you because right now you can only ever have one cart on the go. But then once you log out or you delete your cart, it goes away. So why would you store that in the person's main record? You could just store it in this other table temporarily. Or you could also store a subset of the data that only applies to part of it. For once again, back to the user profile. Username, password, email. That's something every user should have. What's their favorite color? Maybe that should be something else, somewhere else, right? Maybe only half the people want to give out what their favorite color is, so maybe you want to keep that as a separate entry. That's a really facetious example, but, you know, it's a simplified example. I can guarantee you will never create a one-to-one -one relationship in this course. There is no reason to ever do it. And if I ever see you create a many-to-many -many relationship in this course, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> Basically, all you're going to create in here are one-to-many because realistically, that's how data is organized 99.9% .9 of the time. Okay. Cardinality and optionality. Now, if any of you have started reading into the little textbook thing I gave you guys, some of these words are familiar. There's actually pictures that represent the stuff in there. Cardinality represents how many. And by how many do we mean one or more? And can this record have one child or many children? That's, you know, the little crow's foot thing. Optionality determines must it have a parent value to exist? In other words, can an order exist without a customer? No. How can you have an order floating in the system that doesn't have a customer attached to it? It's not optional. Once it's saved in the database, the order must have a customer. Otherwise, it's a customerless order. Who are you going to get your money from? That's what it is. That's optionality. In other words, can this relationship exist without a parent record? On the other hand, Maybe an order can exist without a shipping method attached to it. The order is going to be shipped in three days, but we don't know if we're shipping it using FedEx or Intelcom or Canada Post, depending on what the shipping terms are. But the order exists. It just hasn't assigned which shipping method it has yet. Therefore, it can exist without the shipping method, but, it has to ex but the customer must exist. That's the optionality of it. In other words, does it really need this? Yes. Technically, yes. A, a mandatory, also known as optionality, makes an entity weak. If it's optional, but it can still exist without an optional parent value, then it's a strong entity because it can exist onto its own without deriving value from somewhere else. Yes, the, all these concepts are all interrelated. But yes, essentially, yeah. Okay. Two slides left, then we're done. Now this is totally out in left field compared to everything you've seen so far. Because I'm trying to head off the past labs for people that are reaching ahead. Normally I talk about this next week. I moved it to the end of today. Naming conventions. Now, 
I don't know if, if you guys had your second Java lecture yet. Did they talk about naming conventions at all in lecture one? No? I'm assuming Howard's teaching Java? Yeah, he will be talking about naming conventions. I guarantee it. Naming conventions is a concept that is more common inside the computer world than anything else. But it exists everywhere. It's a set of rules on how things are named. And in the world of database, it's always been a shit show. I'll even use the phrase as is. It's always been a, a mess. And it used to be really loose and free. Essentially, everybody did whatever the heck they wanted. Every company had their own naming convention. So you'd stop working in one place, walk into another job, there, they'd say, these are our naming conventions. And they look like nothing you've ever seen before. They're using Polish notation on their field names. Like, why the heck would you put Polish notation on your field names? I have no idea. Hey, it's a Varkar field. Let's call it... So we know it's a Varkar field. That's, you know, a terrible notation system. But there, I've seen a place where I had to do that. It was just a mess. It was loose and free. And originally, there was space issues. Anybody here ever have a Commodore 64? Okay, I'm getting really old now. I'm not even going to go if you had a VIC-20. Um, but we had 32K of available memory. We actually had databases that ran on that. You didn't call your field var name. You called it A. If you're lucky, B2. And then you had a document that explained. You had a table called A with a column called A, B, B2. Then you looked up in a little book and to figure out what these things meant. <coughs> Documentation was king. And if you didn't have documentation, somebody was being beaten by a, with a baseball bat. It was terrible. Each company had its own standards. Even inside of a given company, each developer had their own little quirks. Why? Neckbeards. They just don't want to conform. They want to do their own thing. They want to put their own little touch on the database structure. And because of that, it would be a nightmare. One to say some tables are plural, some tables are singular, sometimes primary keys are ID, sometimes there's something else. It's all a big mismatch. Now, thank you to modern frameworks. So there's development frameworks that have magically appeared over the last 10 years. There's like something called the de facto standard. Does, does anybody in here know what de facto standard means? Okay. You have a standard standard. So such as stuff that comes out of ANSI and IEEE, and supposedly, you know, telecom. HTML5, supposedly is the standard. There's a standard that's on a piece of paper that says these are the rules. There's a governing body that says these are the rules. A de facto standard is a standard that has evolved amongst the general population where everybody's starting to agree that certain things are the right way of doing things. Nobody's written it down in a book saying this is the only way. It's not a standard. It's a de facto standard. As in enough people agree that, that maybe it's a good thing. And there once was a product called Ruby on Rails. How many of you have heard of that? Okay. Ruby is a language. It sucks. Rails is fantastic. It's a framework. So at this, what made Ruby on Rails so popular, it wasn't the fact that the, Rail, the Ruby language, it was Rails. Rails made dat designing database driven web applications so easy to make by compared to how it used to be that you could take a job that would take three weeks and do it in three days. It was amazing. And they had naming conventions. And if you create your database following these, these rules, magic will happen. And then all the other developers looked like, well, shit, what a great idea. So PHP came out with Cake. Well, they have Cake PHP, Laravel, and Code Igniter, blah, blah, blah. There's like 150 frameworks for PHP. And they all adhere to one of three standards. So you can create your database and pick your framework, and it'll work with it. So if you design your database following a certain naming convention, it'll work all over the place. And then Ruby on Rails died because everybody stole the best feature of Ruby on Rails and made it better than theirs. 
And this standard has now been accepted by you know, some industry leaders such as Microsoft and IBM, not Oracle. Oracle says, no, 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 do it my way, which is the way that was designed in the 70s and 80s. So here are the rules. This is, a, this is a de facto standard set of rules. There's only one thing in here that people are still arguing about, which is the plurality of the table names. And that's a fight that will never end. I can guarantee that. But here are the rules. Everything is lowercase. This actually screws up all the Java people right off the bat, because you guys are taught all right off the bat about camel case business, right? Everything is lowercase in the database. Why? Number one, database servers lie. Actually, let me phrase that, Oracle lies. Some database servers are case sensitive, some are not. MySQL is not case sensitive. It's like a child with crayons. Microsoft SQL Server sometimes is or is not, depending what language it's installed on. If it's installed on a Latinate code page, it's not case sensitive. You install it on some other code page, um, say a South American language code page, Spanish, Portuguese, insert other language here, it suddenly becomes case sensitive. Why? I don't know. Microsoft. Postgres is anally case sensitive. It is so case sensitive it's disgusting, which forces you to actually be a good little munchkin and follow the rules. Oracle says, I'm not case sensitive. What does it do? It takes all your object names and makes them uppercase and stores them uppercase. So every time you type stuff in, it just ignores the fact that what you typed. It lies. No spaces ever. Use underscores. Why no spaces? Because every database server handles spaces differently. The rules are different and rules of engagement are different. The SQL language, which I teach in three weeks, four weeks from now, uses space as the delimiter between keywords. Therefore, if you throw a space in the middle of a table, it thinks you're done talking about that table because you're now inserted a delimiter. No spaces, use an underscore. Tables are plural whenever possible. Exceptions do exist like everything else, like the English language. Names that imply plurality, such as the word log. What is a log? A log is, mul is, a, is a book with multiple entries inside of it. You can have multiple logs, but those actually imply a different log for different things. A log implies plurality on its own. But normally, they're plural. It's not pet, it's pets. Yeah, then I usually, right now I get some clever student says, what about person versus people versus person? Versus peoples. Because those are all valid words. At that point in time, I say pick one. Usually I stick to persons. No matter what people you're from, you're still a person. At least that's my argument. Primary keys are called ID and only ever called ID. Why? Because you don't need to guess. It's called an ID. I look at the table. Oh, there's a column called ID. I wonder what that is. Oh, I don't know. Primary key? Oh, look, there's another table. There's a column called ID in that one, too. What's that? I don't know. Primary key? It's called ID. End of story. Not table something ID, just ID. Foreign keys is where things get painful for everyone. This is the one everybody has a hard time with. We have a table called skills. Notice lowercase has an S. It has a primary key called ID. It has a name, no other values. Now I got a, another table here called person skills. It also has a primary key called ID, but now I've got a column called Skill ID, which happens to be a foreign key. Here's the logic. Foreign keys is the singular version of the parent table name. Skill. Underscore the primary key name, which should always be ID if you're following these rules. 
This is how you read it. This is the idea of a skill. How do I know what the skill is? I go find it in the ID in the skills table. The ID of the skill matches the ID of a specific row in the skills table. So everything before the underscore ID identifies the table, the singular version of the table name, because it identifies one skill. It holds many skills. This is the holy war. This, this, the S right here. Okay, if you had a different database prof, and I'm not going to name his name, he gets mad when he sees me say this. Because he says they should be singular. Because this is a table that identifies a skill, but there, it holds many skills. And he even says the word skills. But it, it's a skill type, therefore it has. So for this course, all your work will be evaluated using these rules. Those of you that did Lab 2 today, I'm not, I'm not even writing Lab 2 for the naming conventions because it wasn't supposed to be taught till next week. So if you bought your naming conventions, such as life, as long as you did the work pretty close to what, actually I literally told you click by click what to do. So you, and there is an example on there which has a small mistake and I know it's there. But all your work, including all your assignments, will be graded using these naming conventions. And if any of you ever go hunt down one of my old students, we'll tell you how draconian I am over my naming conventions. Uh, for most assignments, let's say the assignment's out of 25, there'll be five points for naming conventions. I take off a point for every mistake. There are five free points. I gave you the rules in writing, in a book, usually even on the assignment. And then I usually have 10% of the students that lose all five points because they didn't bother to read the rules. Don't be that 10%. Because I actually do it and go, ha, 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 another one. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people that don't listen. So those are the rules. Naming conventions two. Remember this slide. It's on, it is on Brightspace. I did update the slideshow on Brightspace so that it's there. It is also in that database essentials booklet. Those rules are there. These are the naming conventions for this course. Enjoy. And that is the end. I will see you guys in lab or next week. You may have to come down because I won't be able to hear you. Okay.